and in, and in fact, you know, those are some of the questions I have for Michael Horton in, in one of my articles is that, you know, could it be that we have the same goal, okay, that we want to rightly balance the fact that God is sovereign over creation, whatever that, we can discuss what that means, but that, that God is in ultimate authority over creation and that man is responsible. We, God is an ultimate, I think he said an ultimate authority. We share the same goal. This is what we want. Um, but when you say, could it be, this is my question for our reformed audience here, for Michael Horton specifically, my question is, could it be that once the Westminster Confession of Faith says, God from all eternity did by most wise and holy counsel of his own will, freely and unchangeable ordain whatsoever may come to pass, that as long as you say that, as long as you affirm that, then even if you say and believe, yet so as thereby neither is the God of author of sin. So even if you believe that he does so somehow, in some way, without being the author of sin, could it be that our criticism is, once you say the first part, just saying the second part doesn't make it so. That once you say the first part, the fact that God is the author of sin, ordains evil, however you want to put it, that that logically follows after the first statement, even if you affirm it doesn't, even if you claim it doesn't. That is what our it's, criticism it's, is. It's kind of like it. Kind of like, it, to me, it kind of sounds like you're saying in one in one sentence, you're saying um, bachelors are not married, but bachelors have a wife. Right. Okay. And okay, so, like, and so, if you acknowledge that that's our criticism, <laughs> then you would have to answer the criticism in some other way besides saying, yeah, but I don't believe God is the author of sin, or he does it somehow without being the author of sin. That doesn't answer the criticism. That doesn't assuage the logical train you set in motion. And right. I've never heard like the, 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 an answer the to that. Between, ne and, never heard an answer to that. Well, we've offered an answer to that so many times I've, I've lost count. But notice what Mr. Kemp is assuming. He is assuming that if Ephesians 1.11 is correct, because, I mean, the Westminster Confession is pretty much just utilizing that language. If God ordains whatsoever comes to pass, if he works all things after the counsel of his will, uh, which included the selling of Joseph into slavery, which included the utilization of the Assyrians uh, as punishment against Israel, which included the actions of Pilate, Herod, the Romans, and the Jews then by definition, by definition, there cannot be a basis of justice and righteousness in God's judgment, because by definition, you must exclude compatible. You must conflate the temporal human realm with God's eternal existence, you flatten them out, squish them together, get rid of the decree, you're left with human autonomy. Scripture says you can't flatten it out. It's a diamond. You can beat on it all you want. It's not going to make any difference. And Joseph came to understand what the Westminster framers understood. Isaiah did too. And everybody in the early church prayed that way in Acts chapter 4. So they recognized you can have that objection if you want, but where is the source of the objection? It's your philosophical system. You're not objecting from Scripture. And so you're objecting to a scriptural revelation on the basis of a philosophical reflection, and your philosophy is never any bigger than your cranium. And you may be the most brilliant man on the planet, but you fade like the flower of the grass between morning and evening. You know one one trillionth of what God knows. You know one one billionth of what's going on right now. Your philosophical reasoning is not perfect, as nobody's is, and therefore your basis is very insufficient to challenge the revelation of Scripture that this is, in fact, how God does it. 
And if the little creature demands that the creator show all his cards, well, we're not reading the same source book. Because there are a lot of those creatures in scriptures, in the scriptures that recognize God is God and I am not. So I hear the objection. Okay? Uh, you, but you say you've never gotten an answer. Of course you have. But your philosophical categories will not allow you to even process the exegetical nature of the answer given to you by Scripture. This brings us back again to what is prior. What comes first, divine revelation or man's philosophies? And there, that, that's one of the reasons that the apologetic issue is so important. Because it's still referring us to the same thing. When Scripture makes an end of speaking, so must we. That's based upon an epistemology and understanding of the sufficiency of Scripture and the fact that God provides what we need, not necessarily what we would like, in the extent of that revelation. Now, do I believe that sometime in the future, in the eternity to come, um, there's probably going to be a whole bunch of aha moments where we go, oh, ah, oh, yeah, I'm sure there will be. I'm sure there will be. But till then, when your philosophy requires you to do to Genesis 50 what Leighton just did to Genesis 50, then your philosophy is not a biblical philosophy. It's not a Christian philosophy. It's a humanistic philosophy. And as such, needs to be rejected. Needs to be rejected.